Hi, today's good person to know is Maggie Drim Pocock. She's a space scientist and a government advisor. Maggie is an inspirational woman, not least because she gets to look through the biggest telescopes in the world, some as wide as eight meters long, where she gets to see if there are any non-Earthlings in different planets, but also because Maggie has dyslexia, and despite her learning difficulties, she followed her dream. So how on earth did Maggie get to go to one of the best universities in the world, Imperial College, and mix with people who had brains the size of small planets? Well, it was her dream. She never gave up, but gave up on her dream. As a young child, she bought her first telescope, but it wasn't good enough. So she went to a telescope making club. And when she looked through her telescope for the very first time, that was it. She'd got the bug. Maggie isn't able to go to space, but she's doing the, the next best thing. She's building satellites that orbit the Earth. So if you have a disability, if you have a dream and you feel that you can't achieve it, think twice. Maggie did. Maggie is doing the most amazing job in the world. She gets to look at stars for a living. I hope you enjoy this video and thank you for watching. So I was born in the late 1960s, you know, um, um, Yuri Gagarin had gone into space by then. You know, Neil Armstrong, one small step for man, one down leap for mankind. <laughs> Black is executed in London. Um, I went to 13 schools. The probability of me getting out there or even sort of becoming a space scientist seemed very, very distant. But that's where the power of dreams come in. Having that dream has driven me further than I would have ever thought possible. Growing up in my childhood, I kept trying to find ways of getting in, into space. For a while, I worked for the Ministry of Defence, the MOD. <laughs> and, um, I was quite nervous because, as a, a very young child, I was a pacifist. I, I thought, war was just so silly. If everybody just sort of gave up, wouldn't that be a good solution? I've had a number of jobs, but my favourite job was working here. This is the Gemini Telescope in South America. When I was a child in Camden, I actually wanted to get a telescope. It seemed like a natural thing to do. I watched the sky at night, I wanted a telescope. And I went and bought one from Argos. But when I put it out at the first time, we didn't have much money. But it was true. I went and, and put it out of the night sky. And it was horrible because it suffered from something called a chromatic aberration. That means as the light comes through, it gets split up into different colours. I was so disappointed. I'd saved up my pocket money, and this is what I had. But then I was looking through a magazine and there was an evening class called telescope making classes. And you know, you sort of do a double take. What? Telescope mm -hmm. making? And it's true. You can go and make your own telescope. And that's just what I did. It took probably about six months. But you can actually take two slabs of glass, put something abrasive like sand in between them, and then you wipe the glass. And you wipe, you wipe, you wipe. And it takes a long time. Same thing like the TV. I hope they You keep on wiping the two pieces of glass and then you change shape. One becomes con uh, vex and one becomes concave. And now, what you do, you're actually making a sphere or part of a sphere. But the problem with the sphere is it doesn't bring light to a nice sharp focus. So what you need to do then is work the centre of the mirror to make a shape called a parabola. Now with a parabola, if you get light from a long, long distance away, it brings it to a sharp focus, no chromatic aberration. So this is what I did. I made my first telescope. So I took it out, I put it up at the moon, and I could see the craters. And so I got, I got a, the bug of making instrumentation. My telescope is about 150 millimetres across. The Gemini telescope is 8 metres in diameter. <laughs> 8 metres of light gathering power. <laughs> and this is one of the largest telescopes in the world. And um, further north in Chile, there's another uh, set of telescopes called the VLT. That stands for the very large telescope. <laughs> As astronomers, we sometimes lack imagination. <laughs> I was working on the Gemini telescope, 8 metres. And this is actually a picture of the mirror. Now, usually, when you see pictures of, of people looking through telescopes, usually you see someone wearing a, a tweed jacket, probably a digi bow, and they're sort of looking through the telescope like this. We don't do that anymore. Because with eight metres of light gathering power, if you put your eye up to the eyepiece, you might burn your retina. So what do we do with that light instead? Well, you've seen pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope. Sometimes we do take pictures, but at other times, we build things like this. This was my baby. This was VHOS, which stands for Bench Mounted High Resolution Optical Spectrograph. Snapping. But what the was did is just did something very simple. It took the starlight gathered by the telescope and it converted it into this. Ah, there it is. A rainbow. Now, why was I making rainbows in the lab? Well, rainbows can tell you a lot about what you're observing. So, light from a star could be, it can, can, travels billions of miles. It's gathered up with the loving arms of the telescope, thread through to VHOS, and then when we get a spectra, we can analyse it. And by analysing the spectra, we can tell if that star is moving towards us or moving away from us. 
by looking at these absorption bags, these little black lines in it, you can actually work out what chemical reaction is taking place in the heart of a star. So by building this instrument, I was looking into the heart of stars. And also I was looking at one of the most beautiful places on Earth. In, at the telescope, um, I could stand in the moon shadow of the telescope and look up at the night sky and see the Milky Way up, up before me in the sky. It was one of the most beautiful places I've ever worked on. But my dream has always been to get, to get into space myself. But now I think I'm doing the next best thing. Because I'm building machines that go into space. I'm building these satellites. Now satellites come in all different shapes and sizes. And there's probably about 8,000 active satellites orbiting the Earth as we speak. But they do different things. Lots of communication satellites, you know, beaming Wimbledon across the world. But the sort of satellites I work on are more scientific. They're trying to discover things. And they don't look outwards. Lots of them are looking down here at planet Earth. This is a picture of a satellite called Aeolus. And Aeolus is designed to actually monitor wind speed through the Earth's atmosphere. And it does this because of a better understanding of climate change. Now, climate change is sometimes it appears in the news, sometimes it's sort of quiet. But it's probably the biggest change we're going to face in the future. And so the more data we can get about it, the better, we, the better position we are to tackle it. And this is what science does for us. Sometimes people say science creates problems, but it can also solve problems. I want everybody to have a dream. Because when we don't have a dream, I think we flounder, we languish. When we have a dream, we're focused and we do so much more. So I don't care if it's your best nails, best hair, best shoe designer ever. I don't care. It's having that dream. And, but as well as having the dream, I also want everybody to be aware of science. If you have a dream, what can you do? What can you achieve? Now, this, is what, this is how far I've gone. But everybody has the potential to do so much. And with a dream, you can reach your, we can reach the stars. And when I got to Buckingham Palace, it got very, very formal. And then I was getting more and more nervous. And finally, you know, they called out my name. You know, Dr. Maggie Adair and Pocock for services to science and education. <laughs> That's me. Okay. <laughs> And the thing is, um, they say you're really the queen, you've got to curtsy. And I was so nervous, I had to curtsy, and then I bowed as well. My biggest fear was I was going to give curtsy and trip over. And then the headlines of the newspaper the next day were, you know, Spray Scientist takes out Queen. <laughs> <laughs> so after I curtsied, and I've done it successfully, yeah, the Queen said, no, I'm gonna, this is probably treason, but yeah, the Queen says, Oh, what do you do? <laughs> and I was so excited, I just said, 